I want everybody to stand with me tonight. We're going to start out uh, a little, a little different. Used to me doing that. Um, I need you to look at your neighbor and say, "Have faith." <laughs> All right. Now I need you to say it a little louder to your neighbor. There we go. There we go. Have faith. And then I need you to look at your other neighbor across the aisle, wherever it may be, behind you, and say, you need to forgive others. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now you've got somebody mad at you, so let's go into the sermon. Luke 17, Luke 17 is where we're at tonight. Uh, you can remain standing as we read God's Word. Luke 17, now I've struggled with this message, and the reason I struggled with it is because I've tried to focus on one point. I've tried to focus on one subject here, and you just can't do it in this Scripture. Uh, and if I was to give a title for this passage, it'd be Faith and Forgiveness. We're just going to cover both of them tonight because I can't do this sermon without covering both of them. And I think as we look at this, we'll see they go hand in hand. We see God meant for them to go hand in hand, Faith and Forgiveness. As we start off reading, we're going to start in verse 3. It says this, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Let's bow. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for allowing us to come out and study your word tonight. Dear Lord, I just ask your blessing upon this sermon, dear Lord. Dear Lord, use your words to increase our faith tonight. Dear Lord, just use what you've given us in, in, in your word and help me to preach that tonight and, and convey the message that you've laid on my heart. Dear Lord, just forgive us all our sins. In your name I pray. Amen. There's a few things I want you to know about people that have faith tonight. Number one, people that have faith know that God can make any situation right. If you look back at the first two uh, scriptures of this particular passage, it says, When said he unto the disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Jesus says this and he begins to talk about the judgment to come if, if there is a stumbling block and the one that has caused the stumbling block. And, and here's the point to the first verse. God lets us know that circumstances, trouble, offenses, stumbling blocks, they are inevitable. They're going to come. They're going to happen. He says it's impossible, but that offenses will come. It's impossible to avoid them. They, they're going to come. Trouble is going to come in our life. We're going to have issues with different people. But then it immediately moves on to forgiveness. But I want to focus on this for just a minute. We need to realize that God can make any situation right. As we are sinners in a fallen world, fallen people cause friction. As soon as sin entered the world, husband and wife began to fight. You look at Adam and Eve. What did they do? They started playing the blaming game. And then right after that, their children, they begin to feud over who was the best. Fallen people cause friction. Because of sin, we have feuds. But God dealt with sin. He beat sin and we have hope that He did just that. God is just. Even though God beat sin on the cross, we still have the effects here on this earth. But God throws a reminder here in chapter 17 that He will reign supreme. Woe unto Him whom, whom they come. Verse 2, it gives the judgment of, of, of it would be better if He was put a millstone around His neck and cast into the sea. I'm reminded in those two things of what is said by Paul in Romans. Romans chapter uh, 12 and verse 18. Verse 18. 
Romans 12 and verse 18 reminds us that God will reign supreme and we need to let him reign supreme in our lives. Huh. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. There we go. There wasn't a Romans 18 in my Bible. Um, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. But be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. God reigns supreme. Give, give the one that has offended you, give him good. Defeat evil with good. We need to give our offenses, we need to give our problems to God and let Him deal with them. He's the best. He can deal with them. He is a just God. And that's what verse 1 and 2 reminds me of, is I don't know what that judgment worse than millstone wrapped around your neck thrown in the sea is, but I know that God's in control. And He reigns supreme and His judgment is pure and He is a just God. Also, I want you to know about people that have faith they're able to forgive. In verse 3 it says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Verse 4 and 5 we've already read. And, and then verse 6 comes about. And it says, And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. If we're going to trust in God with our offenses and our problems, then the only reasonable response is to forgive those that cause the problems. If we truly have faith that God can take care of our problems and work through them, why do we hold the bitterness towards someone that caused the problem? It doesn't make much sense if we're truly giving it over to God to hang on to the bitterness of it. If we hang on to bitterness, then we haven't truly trusted God with the problem. The disciples asked for faith in this instance, and, and that may bring us to the question of why would they ask for faith when dealing with forgiveness? They're not trusting God. Look at what Jesus said. Just keep on and keep on forgiving them. Remember back in Matthew 18, Peter asked Jesus, How many times must I forgive someone? And Jesus said, Seventy times seven. And he, he, he said a whole bunch of times. Never any limit, really. You can look at that and say, Well, he said this many. But really, he meant on and on and on and on and on and on. And Peter, I can just imagine the thinking here as he looks over at his brother Andrew and says, that's hard, Jesus. <laughs> my brother Andrew's right here and you know he just drives me crazy sometimes. He's my brother. I grew up with him. And like brothers, they probably fought. And I imagine what Peter really wanted to say is, Lord, I'd rather, really like to just deck him in the face. <laughs> but isn't that just like us? We want to take care of our own problems. We want to deal with the problems that we have instead of giving them over to God. He's much more loving than we are. He's much more just than we are. We need to give our problems to Him. And so when faced with the facts that they needed to forgive people, they simply said, Lord, increase our faith so that we could give it all to you. I think the disciples were on the right track here. They sought Christ to increase their faith. Faith is not just something that comes over in time or through our Christian walk. We must seek the Lord for faith. Romans 12 and verse 1, probably a very familiar scripture with you. It says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that ye may prove what is good, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now focus on the end of this verse. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Who gives faith? God. God gives it. And so it only makes sense as the disciples were seeking faith that they asked God's own son, Jesus, to increase their faith. Another familiar verse with us for us is we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, as we seek God, we must study his Bible. What else proclaims his majesty? What else honors and exhorts God but his word? So faith comes from God and from his word in particular. Jesus takes the lesson of forgiveness a step further. He says this, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you, may say, you might say unto the sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. The sycamine tree is something very interesting to study. And this is where my whole sermon came about is because I never studied this sycamine tree. And, and, and some authors say that the sycamine tree is the same as the sycamore tree. But that's not really true. It's a, it's a different breed. It's a little different word in the uh, Greek language. This tree is so interesting. And I, I just want to read you what one author says about this tree. The sycamine tree looks like a cross between a mulberry tree and a fig tree. It grows to about 30 to 35 feet tall and can live for around 75 years. It produces fruit at least four times a year and it le leaves stay green all year long. The sycamine tree was known for some great characteristics. They have an amazing root system. It didn't get very tall, but it did get very deep. These trees reach down and out with thousands of little roots, some as big as a carrot, but many of them no bigger than an earthworm. It was through all these roots that they were able to grow in very inhospitable environments. If there was any moisture around at all, these roots would tap into it. The rabbis used to say that it would take a man at least 600 years to be able to unravel every root that grows from the sycamine tree. They, they are easy to grow. You don't have to plant them. They just seem to sprout up on their own. They are easy to grow, but almost impossible to kill. Once you get a lump of a clump of sycamine trees growing, you just about can't get rid of them. They are able to produce fruit at least four and as many as six times a year. They seem like the perfect fruit tree, but there's one major drawback. Sycamine fruit is bitter, tart, and pungent. It's similar in appearance to a fig date or a date, but it doesn't taste anything like one. Sycamine fruit is so bitter it can't be eaten in one setting. You have to nibble on it and put it away and then go back to it later. Because of those things, the sycamine tree became a symbol of a life filled with bitterness and unforgiveness. Its roots were compared to the roots of bitterness, thousands of them reaching everywhere. Its ability to grow anywhere and everywhere was exactly like the bitterness and unforgiveness. It doesn't take much to cause some resentment, bitterness, or a spirit of unforgiveness to take root. And once they take root. They seem to stay forever. Its fruit was exactly like the fruit, bitterness and unforgiveness, always plentiful but bitter. When Jesus started talking about the sycamine tree, they knew exactly where he was going. It was a perfect example of what he was, try what he was trying to convey. Little sycamore, sycamine trees of unforgiveness and bitterness were doing their best to grow among all of them. Little sycamine trees were sending out their roots and producing their bitter fruit and doing their best to kill harmony, communion, and cause discord. That is not what Jesus nor 
they wanted. Instead, they wanted to be like Jesus. They had watched Jesus deal with people who were slow to learn. They had watched as they had tried Jesus' patience and tested his soul only to watch him be able to reach out in love, grace, and mercy. They wanted what Jesus possessed. They had one watched how he handled the ridicule and snide remarks of the Pharisees and scribes. They had watched how he was able to get rid of any bitter thoughts of unforgiveness. They had watched as he modeled a life of forgiveness and joy. They had watched all of this and wanted to be like him. Jesus' example here took on a new meaning to them. Because of their Jewish heritage and because of their Jewish learning, they knew symbolically exactly what this represented. And when Jesus said, if you had faith so little as a mustard seed, you could say to your unforgiveness, to your hatred, to, to your problems, be gone and they be gone. God knew that with just a little bit of faith, these people could get the roots of bitterness out of their lives. And they needed to if they were going to be effective for Him. The next thing I want to tell you is people with faith know God is not any more or less powerful because of us. Jesus said this, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could do this great act. If you remember back in Matthew, uh, when Peter, or, or sorry, when Jesus was talking to his disciples there, he said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could take this mountain and then be moved. Jesus' power is not limited to our faith. And I praise God for it. Just because we have little faith sometimes doesn't mean God can't do big things. He is all powerful with or without our faith. The amount of, of God working is not dependent upon the quantity of my faith, but the quality of His power. Sometimes it just takes faith enough to take the next step. And God can do miraculous things through that faith. I want to get real personal tonight because of something I've been thinking about as I went through this message if we want to be people of faith, we cannot expect to see everything. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the evidence of things not seen. As we have stepped in faith, God is blessed. And what I'm referring to is sometimes we get in despair about we can't see what God's doing in this new building project and, and the things the church has going on. But here's the fact. God's blessed. Our baptistry's been full. Our, our front row's been full of people, souls saved. And, and our, our church is filling up because we have people coming and joining us in fellowship. God's blessed. And you say, well, Trey, our building's way over here and this is way over here what God's doing. No, it's simple. Obedience to God equals blessing. And God has blessed us, and as we follow Him, as we do the things that He wants us to do, blessing, blessing, blessing. It's obvious. I hope I'm not the only one that sees it. When we have that faith enough to take the next step that God wants for us, He'll bless us. And His power is not limited to just that next step. He can pull us further and do more with us than we've ever thought. I wonder to myself sometimes, is the reason it seems that small things happen just because I pray small, small prayers? Is my faith limited because I know my God's not? Let's keep the faith. The last thing I want us to see in this passage is people with faith, let God have control. People with faith, let God have control. Look at verse 7 through verse 10. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him, By and by when he is come from the field, go and sit down at meat. 
and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I troll not. So, likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. What God's saying here, you could almost tie into the phrase, Don't get your cart ahead of the horse. And, and what he means here is, he means, if you're a master over these servants, and, and this is going back to Jewish tradition too, you don't send them out in the field and let them work all day and then have supper ready when they get home. They're the servants. They're the ones that prepare the meal. That's their job, is to go work and then to prepare the meal. That's their job. As you are master up here, and you reign supreme. And what God's telling these people is, is so, so beautiful. That when we get to the end of the day, when we, when we look at all our churches done, we're not going to sit back and we're not going to say, okay, we've become God. No, that would be silly, right? He's still in control. He's still the master. He still reigns supreme. And that's the beautiful thing here. We can't look back and we can't say I'm unprofitable. Do you know what Christ has done for you? <laughs> He's given us all this. He's given us the, the opportunity to serve Him. We can't say that we're the Master. That's His job. And people of faith, they let God have control. Let's trust the Lord in faith. Let's give Him the big and the small stuff. Let's trust Him with the ability to forgive others, completely giving Him all of our problems. And as Ephesians 4 and verse 32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. As we get ready for a hymn of invitation, I just want to explain this tonight. God has forgiven you. He died on the cross for your sins because He is able to take any problem and make it right. God died on that cross to pay the price for us so that we could accept that forgiveness and put our faith in Him. Let's have faith tonight. No matter what trouble we're going through, we can turn our eyes towards Him in faith and know that He's in control. As we sing.